Good morning, I am Carmina Manabat and I will be presenting to you my report on eschatology and individual eschatology. All reports are taken from Christian Theology by Erickson Millard from pages 1105 to 1135. All right, let's begin. Here are the following outline. For part one, we have eschatology, where we would tackle, firstly, what is eschatology? Second, the classification of eschatologists. And third, the modern treatment of eschatology. And for part two of my report, um, I will be talking about individual eschatology. One is death, and number two is intermediate state after death. Part 1. Eschatology. What do we mean by eschatology? Eschatology has traditionally meant the study of the last things, or the end. Accordingly, it has dealt with questions concerning the consummation of history, the completion of God's working in the world. In many cases, it has also been literally the final topic considered in the study of theology. On 1 Thessalonians 4.13, we see that eschatology has been established because of hope. As we can see on verse 18 of the same text, it says, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. It is sometimes easy to forget the, that the eschatological truth in God's word, like the rest of his revelation, are intended to comfort and to assure us. Now let's take a look at the classifications of eschatologies. Number one, it is the thought of us pertaining primarily to the future or things that has not happened yet or to the present, which means the here and now. That's why it's called the present. Now the, there are four different kinds of views under this and we have the futuristic view, the preterist view, which, is, which holds that the events described were taking place at the time of the writer. Since they were current for the writer back then, they are now in the past. And then um, another one is the historic view. I think that is pretty much understandable. And number four is symbolic or idealistic view. It is uh, the view that holds that the events described are not to be thought of in a time sequence at all. They refer to the truth that are timeless in nature, not to singular historical occurrence. Number two view would be um, the view of the future of life here on earth, primarily optimistic, meaning that there is improvement in condition, or pessimistic or negative, or meaning that there would be general worsening of the circumstances of the human existence. And then number three, in the classification of eschatologies, we have, is divine activity or human effort thought to be the agent of eschatological event? If divine activity, then this would be regarded as supernatural. And if human effort, then they will be viewed as a result of familiar and natural processes. Okay, let's go to number four. Is the focus of eschatological belief this worldly? Meaning that, is it, are we expecting God's promises um, to largely come to pass upon this earth? So there would be continuity with life as we now experience it? Or would it be um, otherworldly? Meaning, um, will his promises be fulfilled? Or will there be a deliverance uh, from this earth and his promises will be fulfilled in heaven? or some place or situation that is radically different from what we are now experiencing. And then number five, does the particular view speaks of hope or the church alone? Um, meaning, uh, do the benefits that we anticipate can occur only to believers or are they promises to everyone? And then also or uh, the church alone, or for human race in general, meaning um, is the church the agent or the vehicle of the good things coming to all? Okay, number six, will we come to a benefit of the new age individually, 
or will it be cosmic in character? Meaning, uh, does God promises will be fulfilled in one all inclusive occurrence or will its effect uh, may not be limited to human beings but may involve other segments of creation there may well be a transformation of the natural order and the number seven is there a special place for the jewish people in the future occurrences as god's chosen and covenant people in the old testament the jewish um, do they still have a unique status or are they simply like the rest of the human race? So those are um, all the classification of eschatologies. In the orthodox circles, consequently, eschatology and the Holy Spirit were only rarely of vital interest or major objects of concern. It was in the cults or in the radical French groups, and these doctrines were taken very seriously and given dynamic and aggressive expression. But in the 20th century, however, both doctrines became matters of much broader interest and concern. So now let's take a look at the modern treatment of eschatology. All right, first on the list is the liberal approach, the modernized eschatology. Jesus' teaching, as they see it, the second coming is rather strange, and their view is that the real message of the second coming is the victory of God's righteousness over the evil world, blended with the doctrine of progress. In um, essence, they reject the idea of the second coming. Okay, number two is Albert Schweitzer. It's called the modernized eschatology. Schweitzer believed that Jesus failed in his first attempt to introduce his cosmic kingdom. So Jesus was destroyed. He died a martyr's death. It is um, this um, true historical Jesus and not the modern Jesus that we are to follow. For Jesus cannot be made to fit our conception. He will reveal himself to those who obey his command and perform the task he has set them. And it will all happen in the future and then opposite to that is the number three is ch dodd which is called the realized um, eschatology basically he agrees everything um, um of what schweitzer think except for um he believed that the kingdom of god has already arrived that's why it's called realized eschatology um during the first advent of jesus or when he first came here on earth Okay, and the fourth is Rodolf Bultmann, Existential Eschatology. I think this is the most strange one. <laughs> Bultmann insisted that much of the New Testament is a form of mythology, meaning, you know, myth. It, it doesn't really exist, or it didn't really happen. Well, that is the accounts are existential, meaning it does not tell us what actually happened. For Bultmann, the eschatological realities like resurrection, eternal life, Antichrist do not depend on whether a particular event has yet transpired, for they are true in a timeless existential sense. All right, uh, fifth on the list is Georgian Maltman, politicized eschatology. Uh, the inspiration for this theology stems from his personal experience while he was a prisoner of war in a British camp. Maltman aiming to realize Christian hope develop a political theology to transform the world. Yet the future will not be achieved primarily by our work, but by God's doing. But in order to attain the future, which is our hope, um, this requires an action, not theological explanation. And that is according to Jarjan Maltman. All right, finally, uh, number six, dispensationalism. It is a systemized eschatology, and I think most of us would relate to this one. The developer uh, was Nelson, John Nelson Darby. The system is the method of interpreting scriptures. The core belief is that the scripture is to be interpreted literally, 
except for obvious metaphorical passages that are not to be taken literally. But if plain meaning makes sense, then one should not look any further. And one of the major belief is um, the millennium, which is found in the book of Revelation. Um, during the time, um, God will resume his dealings with Israel. Oh, by the way, traditional uh, dispensationalists also put great stress on the distinction between Israel and their church. So there, uh, these are two different entities. Some of them, in fact, regard this distinction as fundamental to understanding scripture and organizing eschatology. So Israel is the old covenant people in the Old Testament, and the church is us, uh, the new believers um, in the New Testament. And um, just like what I said, um, during the millennium, God will resume his dealing with Israel. And the church, having even taken out of the world or raptured, um, sometime earlier, which means uh, pre-tribulation, just prior to the Great Tribulation, the millennium consequently will have a markedly Jewish character. And the unfulfilled prophecies regarding Israel will come to pass at that time. Phew, that was a mouthful on part one. Now let's go to part two of my report, which is individual eschatology. Hang on. Okay, I think this is one of those um, subjects that we rarely talk about. But uh, it is also a undeniable fact about the future of every person, and which is inevitably death. There is a direct assertion on these facts in Hebrew 9.27 where it says, people are destined to die once, and after that, to face judgment. The thought also runs through the whole of 1 Corinthians 15, where we read of the universality of death and the effect of Christ's resurrection. While death is said to have been defeated and its sting removed by his resurrection, there is no suggestion that we will not die. Paul certainly anticipated his own death, as found on 2 Corinthians 5, 1-10 and Philippians 119-26. So the reality of death. Um, in, the, in its end, the process um, of decline of our mortal, corruptible bodies. And according to 2 Corinthians 4, 11 to 12, it says that for we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work, work in us, but life is at work in you. Okay, now let's talk about the nature of death. According to the Bible, there are three types of death. The first one is physical death. It is the separation of the soul from the body. Then we have a spiritual death, which is the separation of the person from God. Yeah, this is sad because this is where people did not accept the free gift of salvation that is given to us by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then um, the third one is eternal death, or the second death, which is the final state of those um, previous mentioned um, kinds of death. Um, this is wherein one is lost for eternity, forever, in his or her sinful condition. The second death, however, woo, good news <laughs> to all of us who has accepted our Lord Jesus as our Lord and Savior, uh, will not be experiencing the second death. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. All right, so let's keep on um, telling people about the good news of our salvation. All right? Okay, now let's move on to um, the what they call the intermediate state. This is an issue that is both very significant and problematic. Um, this refers to the condition of the humans between their death and resurrection. Now the question is, what is the condition of the individual during this period of time? You want to find out? Well, let's find out together. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, here it goes. The current views of the intermediate state. So there is this thing 
that they call the soul sleep. This is the idea that the soul during the period between death and resurrection reposes in the state of unconsciousness or dreamless sleep. Um, they believe that the person is in unitary entity, meaning that the human person, body and soul are one entity. Therefore, when the body ceases or stop to function, the soul ceases or stop to exist. Nothing survived physical death. Well, the Bible is very clear on this um, counter, to counter this kind of belief. And you can find the Bible references on Luke 16, verses 19 to 31, which is the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Okay, one of the most popular intermediate state is the purgatory which is um, the belief of um, our Roman Catholic friends. Uh, it is a middle state where people may be cleansed by suffering um, of their venial sin. Um, venial sin meaning um, they're not very major sins um, that uh, deserves uh, to go to hell. So uh, there are three ways that the soul can be assisted according to the Roman Catholic. Um, in order to go to heaven, and that is um, by mass, prayer, and good works. Joseph Paul defines it as, um, you know, purgatory as a state of temporary punish punishment or those who, departing this life and the grace of God, are not entirely free from venial sins or have not yet fully paid the, satisf the satisfaction due to their transgression. We know that um, the Catholic believes in good works um, in order for them to go to heaven. The, um, of course, the biblical reference to refute or to counter their claims, we can see it on Galatians 3, 1 to 14, Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. Now, this is a very good note. There is something quite appealing with this view, isn't it? But the teaching of the Bible must prevail, not what appears to us personally or as logical and just. All right? Okay, last but not the least, um, the third one is the instantaneous resurrection or instant reclothing. This is the belief that immediately upon death, the believers receive the resurrection body that has been promised, like you're dead and then boom, you know, immediately. But, um, we have biblical passages um, to repute or to counter this claim. And it can be found um, here, where Apostle Paul ties the transformation of our bodies to the future resurrection in the second advent or the second coming of Christ, which is found in Philippians 3, 20-21 and 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians 4, 16-17. Also, the Apostle Paul makes clear that the, the second coming uh, as, as an occasion for deliverance and for glorification as found on um, this uh, Bible verses here. And also, um, of course, our, our Lord Jesus emphasizes a future time when the dead will be raised. And that is found on John um, chapter 5 verses 25 to 29. All right, finally, let's go back to that question. What happened to the Christian during the intermediate state? Well, I thank God that I um, I am the one who reported on this topic, and now it is very clear to me. Um, as a Christian dispensationalist, um, I believe that when we die, we will go to the intermediate place called paradise, or Abraham Bosom, as found in the parable of uh, Lazarus and the rich man. Then together, we will all have our resurrection body at the same time. Um, the dead in Christ in the past and who are alive in the time of the rapture um, will have our resurrection body at the same time. Then we will all enter heaven at the same time as described in 1 Thessalonians um, chapter 4, verses 6 to 17. 
So that's it. And I hope that you guys learned something today because I surely did. And uh, this is a very enjoyable um, topic um, to discuss. And um, may God bless everyone. All right. Bye.